Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode uh, 311, uh, featuring the fourth and final installment of my interview with Anthony and Nicola Caulfield, the producers of From Bedrooms to Billions and The Amiga Years. After that segment, I will have a special segment for you called uh, Matt's uh, Top 10 Favorite Amiga Games, which I think you guys will also enjoy, so stay tuned uh, for that. Anyway, we've got a lot of stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Anthony and Nicola Caulfield. I remember it got so bad. I remember the sort of as the as Amiga magazines finally started to dry up. There was actually a movement for a while where they were encouraging the readers to buy up stock. You know, they're trying to get up enough control, I guess, to actually fire these you know idiots and get somebody in there that would, you know, <laughs> have half a brain. It just it's amazing they couldn't sell this thing. We yeah. did discover that very very um, right at the end after the U.S. A Commodore had gone bust in the US. Um, a couple of the European guys, including uh, David Pleasance, the head mm -hmm. of the Commodore UK, they were um, they actually put together a business plan to carry on carry Commodore on. And it's quite interesting what happened mm -hmm. because they were three days away from signing the deal. We'll reveal it in the and film. we'll reveal it in the film. <laughs> <laughs> Some dirty corporate tricks got involved and yeah. scuppered the whole thing. Yeah. And that killed it. And then within the and and well, you only you can probably work out what happened from yeah. that because you'll see what who did take over Commodore. Mm. Well, if you guys suddenly disappear, we'll know who to blame. Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it, I think I think that's the thing. It's I don't think there was ever a question on the product itself. Sometimes it's all about how you actually package it and sell it. Yeah. And certain divisions of Commodore got it absolutely right. Hence the fact that it sold so well. But if it should have sold brilliantly. In the, it should have. It didn't even sell a million units in the in the US. It was something like seven hundred. It is a really interesting story. It's quite sad. It's, you know, it's worthy of a documentary, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope someone does it. Yeah. Yeah. Find some. Who would be crazy enough to embark on a, a project <laughs> like <laughs> like that? Well, I guess that's about all all, all I've got for you today. I, I do have sort of a personal fun question. I guess is you know. Sure. In that little BBC breakfast thing, I noticed you had all these computers that were signed by people. And I was wondering uh, if you had a, a favorite one, or are there signatures out that you still are trying to collect? Hmm. That's a good one, actually. Yeah. I think that, again, it all goes back to Matthew Smith, I think. I think I'd probably like Andrew Braybrook to sign my Commodore 64. Yeah. I think that would be nice. I think yeah. he's, um, he's, uh, he's a real hero of ours, but he's... Uh, he um, he's he was quite camera shy, and he sent us a lovely couple of emails. Um, he really enjoyed yeah, the really film, supported and the very film. supportive. But not everybody's comfortable in front of camera. Yeah. Um, probably the Stamper twins, the, the twins, the Stamper <laughs> brothers yeah. signing our ZX Spectrum would be nice. But yeah. they are. Um, the but funny... I think we were really happy to get Matthew Smith. Yeah, Matthew that Smith was, was the that one was, that. Yeah, it, we yeah. really wanted that one. And we're really glad because there was a um, there was a documentary in the UK where somebody tried to sort of do a quick sort of thing about the games industry, and he declined them, but he said yes to us, and we were really chuffed about that okay. because uh, we couldn't we couldn't get anybody in broadcast to support our project or anything, and we didn't want anyone coming in at the last minute and trying to do their own version or something. And he just said no, he preferred working with us, which we were quite chuffed. We yeah. thought that was really sweet because I think I think the thing is we found that. It was almost like a counselling session. So many of the interviews that we did, um, counselling session. Yeah, they yeah. were they were unloading. Yeah, certainly when you're speaking to a developer that had a wonderful period of say four or five years, and then risked everything in the early '90s and then lost their house or mm. something like that. They they bet the farm and lost. So and then now they work in insurance or they you know they work in a different sector altogether and then we've come up out of the blue and said can we talk to you about your career from 25 years ago so when you get to that part of the story they start they break down yeah, quite so emotional. there was quite a few of that there's quite yeah. I would say there was about maybe 15 about hmm. 15 people that probably broke down on camera where we had to stop for a moment and and just you know because for them it was something that was you know we're talking part of their life you know, for them, it was a major deal. It wasn't just a bit of fun. 
well, it was a bit of fun at the start, but as soon as it became a something that they were doing and then, yeah, and then now they're not doing it anymore. So in certain cases, they're very very sad. Yeah. And um, we had to be respectful of that, and you know, be very careful in how we represent people in the film. Yeah. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to add or talk about uh, that we haven't covered? Have you, have you thought about what you might do after you're finished with the Amiga, uh, the Amiga years? There's the TV, yeah. there's the, the episodic version, which is, is more, it would allow us to find a home for all the extra extra material that would that's all an obvious because there's so much extra material yeah. um there's a there's a there is another platform that, that we're kind of interested in um that we think that we could do a, a have a do a good job on um it's quite a big one um but we'll have to see that we'll have to see if we can yeah. do that at some point oh, so much to think about yeah 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 but we're not sure yet yeah, it's I think once we uh, with the Amiga years, I think once we started putting from bedrooms together, we kind of then felt we can't cover the Amiga in the depth that we want to. So we kind of halfway through editing the film realised, I think we're going to be looking at another film to cover that. So we kind of identified that. And then, so you never know, we might end up when we're editing the Amiga years, think, oh, well, we can't really go into too much detail with that. That'll become our next film. So yeah, yeah we've got a couple of ideas. You got to really yeah. immerse yourselves in it to make it. It's it's re it's all consuming. Mm. It's um, it's all consuming to create it. It's uh, it, it it's um. I would probably somebody actually said to me when I said that to them before. Actually, a developer said it's more like making a game yeah. because it becomes your life and you want to do the very best you can. So and we're very lucky. To be able, to, thanks to Kickstarter crowdfunding, which is a you know has been a godsend for us, to be able to um, to be able to do that. And I think the thing is, it's really important to us that we like the whole crowdfunding mechanism because we really like the idea that people want to see what we're doing. So we find that we, you know while it's a pressure, it's a good pressure because we don't want to let them down. And we sort of think if if it's something we're proud of. Then they sh they'll hopefully they'll well, like well, it. Well, from bedrooms we did take that to broadcasters, um, and we just couldn't get anyone to pick it up. And that was over about three, five years. We keep going in with this idea, tweaking it, and everything. No one was was interested. And then when we discovered Kickstarter, we were like, okay, well maybe we can we can go that route. So it has been very good for us. It gives us complete control. You know, when you do anything for a broadcaster and that, you don't always have complete control. It has to you have to go by certain things that they want. So yeah, that's why we really like Kickstarter. And we do really like engaging our backers. That's great. And very we get so many lovely comments. Because the thing is once you start filming and that it literally is just me and Anthony. <laughs> so you're kind of so isolated from it all that when we do get these comments saying, you know, we really like what you're doing, we love your last film and, and saying, oh, are you going to cover this in the film? And we love that because it's like, oh, people are thinking about us and what we're doing. So we, we enjoy it, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it's, uh, you know, you really feel that. Hmm. You, you feel it's meaningful and it's and people want to see it. And yeah. I think, personally, I think the whole the video <coughs> games industry needs um, needs more people do it, you know, to, to really, you know, the, Eric Chai said to me yesterday, I, you know, I said to him with another world, I consider it art. And he said, he, in his mind, it is art completely. It's uh, and and we and you don't use the word retro about old paintings. You no. just say a wonderful, a wonderful painting, wonderful piece of art. Right, yes, yeah, painting. Something. You wouldn't think of a painting as being obsolete. Yeah, you don't say, "Oh, there's a retro." I'm going to go and what, listen Matt to. Mona Lisa. I'm going to listen to some <laughs> retro records. I'm going to listen to the Beatles. You don't. You just say, I'm going to listen to a Beatles album. You know. You, so I don't quite see um, why, why that's such. A, however, I'll tell you one thing. You were saying about John Hare. We will go in a minute. I promise. Um, <laughs> You were saying about John Hare earlier. He's he made quite a, really, a character. He made a very interesting point when we interviewed him the other week for this film. He said, if you produce a piece of music, like you know, like the Beatles or, or you produce a work of art, he said that there's no issue with formats because music will just be converted to whatever format it's available to be sold on, whether it be vinyl, cassette tape, CD, MP3, all of that. He said, whereas with video games, once our format dies off, he said, he was talking about Sensible World of Soccer, for example, he said, once the Amiga died out, 
he said, and then the Mega Drive, he said basically that was the end, we didn't get any more royalties, the game stopped selling. Whereas if you release a successful album, you'll pretty much continually get royalties all, you know, pretty much for the rest of your life, providing the album has got that sort of longevity. And I thought that was an interesting point. So we are at an interesting time now where you're starting to get you know, Valve and um, and GOG and and um, other platforms that are, that are actually cultivating classic games and allowing them to be available um, and allow royalties. Clonto. Clonto. Did you talk to those guys at all? Not yet. I and mean, that's the thing. I mean, we could we could do a whole film on on that on about yeah. the way that the so there's there's a lot of ideas that we've got. Um, there's a lot of ideas actually, and we think that this. This industry needs needs people to to start really doing proper content about it and mm. re respect it because it's it employs a lot of people and it creates a lot of fun and it's a you know while it, like any industry it's got its ups and downs but you know it could be a lot worse it's a really it's a positive vibrant um, great industry with a rich history and yeah. I think that it needs uh, it needs to be to be told yeah the his history is definitely the word for it. Uh I mean, if it weren't for projects like yours, these people would just die off, and you know, they'd be we just wouldn't have their stories. Period. Yeah, I, funny enough, that was that was one of the things that we used to say on from bedrooms was yeah. we wanna we wanna catalog these stories while the main protagonist is still around to tell the tale. Yeah, you know, that's bad. That's sort of a nicer way than saying before they die. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's inevitable. You know, as uh, exactly. Ralph Bear passed away not too pass. long ago, that was just managed to get him. Maybe a couple of years before that. Would you like to hear one quick anecdote that didn't go in the film? Okay. Which I think, which I think epitomizes um, those early programming days, and this would be in the U.S. as well as the U.K. Okay. There was so a, game a pretty good build-up here. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Listening. Well, there was a, there was a, there was a, a computer that was very U.K.-based called the ZX81, and uh, it did okay in Europe, and, but it was 1K of memory, and it had a membrane keyboard. It's in the film. It had a RAM pack on the back that if you even touch the computer even slightly, the RAM pack would wobble because it had absolutely no support and the computer would restart. And the screen would flash. And the screen, it? yeah, that was a ZX80. Oh, if you ZX80. press the keyboard, oh, it yeah, couldn't maintain that, yeah. video memory. <laughs> uh, so one keyboard press meant the processor <laughs> accept it and then the screen would roll. But yeah. there was a way around that. Yeah. But anyway, ZX81, uh, there was a chap called Malcolm Evans, right? He now programs trajectory systems for satellites. So he's quite. He's quite probably a lot easier. Yeah. He's got a very, you know, huge IQ and brain. But so he, he, he even making a cup of coffee, he he takes it as as solving a problem. Right, I must unscrew the lid and you know put the spoon in and all that stuff. So in 1981, he created a game called um, 3D Monster Maze. Which, oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, check it out on YouTube because it's a it, technically it's 16. Roll up, roll up. Need, yeah. Exactly, but it's a it's a effectively three D. He mm -hmm. he was able to create a sort of faux three D on a on a on a one K machine, which he then ended up using the sixteen K RAM pack. But I won't I won't mix that through. Anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, he wrote the game. He, he imagined himself walking through a maze, first person game, um, and about released it, and everybody went, "Wow, it's a you know first person perspective game." arguably the first time seen on a home computer, certainly something with only 1K on a membrane keyboard. Anyway, he, Clyde Sinclair, who created the ZX81, um, met him at a, sh at a show or something about a year or so later and came up to him and said, Malcolm, um, how did you create a 3D game on the ZX81? It's impossible. It can't be done. It, I, I, we, I can't work out how you did it. It's impossible. And Malcolm just turned and looked at him and sort of said, well... What it is, is my brother lent me the ZX81, but he didn't give me a manual, so I didn't know it was impossible. And that just to me, that just, that just to me symbolised it. He just thought, I wonder if it would be possible to do such and such. Oh, no, I'll try and see. And then next thing, a game, a game is created. And that problem-solving element epitomises so many developers. They've got a problem in their mind, and in the solving it, they create a game idea. Let's get this party started with the Defender of the Crown at number 10. Oh, this is a game that was absolutely mind-blowingly awesome back in the time of its release. The graphics uh, sprite art by Jim Sachs, amazing 
extremely talented man, as you can see. Look at that castle. Awesome stuff. The Hollywood-esque cutscenes in here, it felt like you were at the movies. <laughs> it's just unpre unprecedented, uh, spectacular stuff. This is what you booted up to show off why you just spent the equivalent of four or $5,000 on a new computer called an Amiga. It's Defender of the Crown, baby. Awesome, awesome stuff. Number nine, we're going to shift into something a little more obscure. This is a shareware game called Deluxe Galaga. Now, this is something not everybody has played, and it's a real shame because it is a true gem, especially considering this was shareware. Uh, graphics look great, but really, this is all about the gameplay. It's uh, the Galaga theme, but with all kinds of cool power-ups and uh, money you can collect and interesting enemies and even boss fights. It's just really, really, really fun. Now, this is coming to you from somebody who is not a big fan of shmups. You know, I don't play a lot of these games, but this is one I can really get behind and just play for hours and hours. And if you have an Amiga, or even if you just uh, stuck with an emulator, be sure to try out Deluxe Galaga. And at number eight, we have one of my favorite artillery games, Scorch Tanks. Now, it's a little bit of a toss-up between this game because I and uh, Worms, which I also love, but... Uh, this game, you know, Worms gets enough attention. I haven't heard very much about this game, Scorch Tanks. And again, that's a real shame because it's it's really fun, really innovative. Uh, fun things like those shields that can actually re uh, magnetically uh, deflect shots. And really calls for lots of very thoughtful strategy. And it's just a lot of fun, especially in a party. <laughs> you know, blowing up your little brothers and maybe your dad. Uh, never gets old. We got Dirt Ball. This will basically... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to figure out another strategy to get around this guy's uh, shield. Uh, it's just a really fun, well-designed game uh, by Dark Unicorn Productions. One of the really cool differences between this game and Worms is that in between the rounds, you get to buy uh, new equipment, new armor and shields, and you get more money depending on how you do. So nice little element of strategy there, too. And here we go with one of my favorite graphical adventure games. Oh, it's Shadowgate. Love this game. Even though I've beaten it, I sometimes just boot this thing up just from sheer enjoyment of the ambiance. Love the interface. Kind of a Windows GUI based, uh, almost looks like Workbench. Of course, this game was developed on a Macintosh, but if you play that version, it's only in black and white. So obviously you probably want to play the Amiga version instead. Really creepy game. Not quite as scary as Uninvited. But still, not without its share of uh, eeriness. It's also one of the my first adventure games that I was actually able to get all the way through without having to resort to cheats or hints or anything. Uh, so in my opinion, it's, it's very uh, well balanced in terms of difficulty. Really, really fun game, Shadowgate. And now getting back to the action sphere, we have a little game called Turrican, part of a, a three-game series, very popular uh, series on the Amiga. It's extremely difficult. Of course, there are trainers available if you want to just savor the wonderful music and graphics and sound effects in this game. I actually have the soundtrack downloaded as my, my workout music. It really gets me pumped up. But the game itself is, is really cool. If you think, think something like Metroid uh, meets maybe Contra, you know, there's a complexity to it that's lacking in a lot of, uh, of uh, games of this type. It's also, as I mentioned, fiendishly difficult. But it's a beautiful game to behold and quite fun. Here's another one of those games that's very near and dear to my heart just because of the nostalgia factor. My, my dad and I played the hell out of this game, Ports of Call, and I haven't really ever played anything else quite like it. It's uh, about the closest I can come is maybe something like Trains or uh, perhaps Elite. Basically, you're running this shipping industry in modern times going from port to port, loading up cargo, and it's, it's got a mix of a sort of business simulation, but also these cool arcade mini-games, which can get quite difficult. We'll show you one here in a second. We will try to get out of the port. You know, this game gives you a good, a really solid appreciation for what these uh, pilots, these massive vessels have to go through. And once again, we have the unparalleled artistic beauty of Jim Sachs. And all these sequences always just have you on the edge of your seat wondering if this big honking piece of metal can turn fast enough. Oh my god! And here is one of my favorite war games of all time, Empire. Of course, based on an old mainframe game by Walter Bright. Lots and lots of fun. Imagine something like Civilization, but without the tech tree. 
So you just start off with uh, World War II era planes and tanks and destroyers and battleships and uh, aircraft carriers. There's just a lot to this game. You can really get yourself deeply immersed into the strategy. Uh, but it's also simple enough that you can learn the rules fairly quickly and get down to <laughs> decimating your opponent. It's also just enough randomness in here to keep things interesting. Uh, just a, a well done, well balanced game. Everybody should play this that's even remotely interested in strategy games. And one of my favorite memories of childhood, playing Syndicate. A game I will give the number three slot to on my little list here. A really cool cyberpunk, uh, real-time strategy game. Lots of action here, and lots of sort of grim, dark moments. And you've got a lot of fine tuning and fine control over each of these agents. You can send them anywhere you want to. They don't have to stay in a group if you don't want. Uh, lots of different kinds of weapons. Uh, this one does have a tech tree. Uh, at least you can learn, research new technologies and make your uh, guys more powerful. Give them better armor, and more cy better cybernetic implants. You can get better weapons, just all kinds of really cool stuff. There's even ways to brainwash <laughs> uh, the people that you come across. This is one I played all the way through several times back in the day. And even here now, I'm tempted to get back into it. Awesome game. And at number two, a game that no Amiga owner would ever want to be without. This is Lemmings, one of the all-time classics for the platform. Really uh, cutesy graphics, catchy music, but what really sells this is this uh, really clever gameplay. You can sort of program these Lemmings, if you will, give them jobs to do, and try to get them through these very creative and very diverse levels into this portal at the end. So they're making their way through the game. Lots of uh, dark inappropriate uh, humor sprinkled in here. Of course, these guys go on to create a Grand Theft Auto, which might seem like a stretch, but even this game has its share of gore and violence to it. Ah, uh, lemmings. And I'll give my top spot to one of my favorite games of all time on any platform, Settlers by Blue Blight. Now this is, the, the Amiga had its share of these, uh, what do you call them, uh, real-time strategy games, of course, the Dune 2. Uh, but this uh, game, Settlers, to me, had a bit more charm to it. I love these little settler guys, like all the sort of medieval-style buildings you can build. Uh, there's a humor to this, and there's definitely enough complexity here to really get you deeply immersed, not just in the combat aspects, but all the economical or the economic aspects to it, like the, the graphics here, the aesthetics. It's got a great soundtrack, <laughs> which I turned off, unfortunately. But there's a lot to enjoy and savor about this game. Highly, highly recommend Settlers to anybody. Even if you don't like real-time strategy games, definitely give this one a try. You might find yourself addicted. Now, there are several later Settlers games, but for some reason, I just, I just was never able to get into those as much as this first one. Uh, I guess everybody has their preferences, but, you know, this one is just the one that I prefer, even to this day. I love it. I think you will, too. Give it a try. Settlers! And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a special interview segment with the makers of Orion, Orion Legacy of the Cory Aiden. Uh, these are developers from the Cameroon and Central Africa, and it's really, really intriguing stuff. Action role-playing game with uh, African traditions and folklore involved. Uh, I know you guys will enjoy that. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know if I'll have my video out before their Kickstarter is over, so uh, please go ahead and check out their pitch and uh, support it if you think it uh, looks interesting to you. I think you'll agree it's definitely worth uh, your support. As always, I want to thank you, thank you very, very, very much for your support of this show and keeping Matt, these uh, Matt Chat episodes coming. It's uh, completely because of you guys, so thank you very much for that. Uh, if you would like to step up to the plate, just remember a dollar, two dollars, or whatever you think the show is worth to you, just please uh, head over to the Patreon link in the show notes and become a Matt Chat supporter. And then you can get involved in all the cool uh, stuff like the Google Hair Hangouts and all that fun stuff. So uh, thank you very much for your support. Now what about that news from the Matt Cave? Well, let's see. A couple of cool things. I've already mentioned the first item that the 
uh, Orion Legacy of the Corey Aiden. Orion, I'm not sure, I keep forgetting how to pronounce that, but anyway. Uh, Kiro Games, they got a week left on that, trying to raise 42.5, or they're trying to raise 45K, they're up to 42.5K. And so I'm sure they'll meet their goals, but it wouldn't hurt for you to head on over there and uh, pledge to that. I think you'll like the look of the game. The Battletech uh, franchise is back in a major way. Hairbrain Schemes launching a Kickstarter. Uh, they tried. They were tried to raise 250k and ended up with 1.6 million, uh, with plenty of time left to go. So that's really exciting. It's a turn-based uh, mech warrior game. I'm thinking it's going to be something like uh, the earlier BattleTech games, but uh, we'll learn a lot more uh, next week after I've talked to the developer behind that. So as always, let me know if you have questions you would like me to forward to them. And then final bit of news: uh, Vintage Games 2.0, a book authored by yours truly is uh, now available for pre-order. You can get this from the publisher's website. It is uh, $46, uh, which I'll admit, yes, you know, it's, it's a pretty good, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of expensive, but I think you'll find it well worth it. Really just reworked the whole thing. Lots and lots of uh, deep research went into this, uh, fantastic stories. Uh, the first one was more or less kind of a reference book. Uh, this is more like a good novel is what I was trying to uh, go for there. Uh, something you would pick up and not be able to put down until you were finished with it. So I'm really proud of it. I'm really uh, eager to see what you guys think about it. Uh, so if you uh, want to pre-order it, go ahead. Otherwise, I guess you can wait for it to show up at your uh, bookstores or on Amazon. Okay. Uh, what about that ale of the week? Uh, well, this week I've got a little something special. This is a Buffalo Sweat, uh, which I've had before. But this is a special version of it, a bourbon barrel aged version. Uh, really exciting. I like the uh, bourbon flavors in ale. Uh, bourbon barrel aged oatmeal cream stout. Uh, this is uh, part of their Explorer series. I think this is Tall Grass. Uh, so yeah, Tall Grass Brewing Studio. Uh, <laughs> studio. <sighs> Tall Grass Brew. Tall Grass. I'll get it right. Tall Grass Brewing Company out of Manhattan, Kansas. Now, I was looking at this can a while ago, and I don't see anything about alcohol content on it. So, not really sure, but usually a bourbon barrel one will be on up there. So, it wouldn't surprise me if this had 9, 10, uh, maybe even a more, a higher percent of alcohol in this. So, definitely not something you would want to chug. So, let's chug it. All right. So, I got some of this bourbon barrel aged buffalo sweat here in the rather excellent drinking horn. But smelling, it's kind of a, you can smell the... Sort of coffee flavors to this. Definitely very smoky aroma. A little bit of something I can't quite detect. Maybe a bit of a caramel-like uh, flavor or uh, a scent to it. Anyway, it smells really good, so let's give it a taste. Definitely taste the bourbon in this. I mean, it almost kind of dried out my throat just then. Now, this must be very strong uh, on the alcohol content. But surprisingly, it's, it's very smooth actually going uh, down. Uh, a little bit of a, a little dry, but that, nothing wrong with that. Kind of a sweet aftertaste, tasting kind of a, I guess kind of the oatmeal flavor. Not really tasting much in way of bourbon though. I'll try it again here. Yeah, just not a real strong bourbon taste with this. A little bit towards uh, towards the end there. And what I'm really tasting though is that sort of buffalo sweat, uh, the sort of coffees and chocolate flavors there with a little bit of oatmeal, because uh, it's an oatmeal stout. You know that would make perfect sense. Actually, uh, quite a pleasant drink here. I guess the way I would describe this is if you take an ordinary buffalo sweat and make it a little bit drier tasting, maybe uh, probably uh, ratchet up the alcohol content. Uh, you get this, uh, you know, I like the buffalo sweat just fine. This is a nice uh, addition to that library, if you will. Uh, Much of strong alcohol in this. Uh, I'm going to go, I guess, uh, maybe four out of five drinking horns on this. A really tasty brew. If you like buffalo sweat, hey, you know, why not try this one? It's not the uh, best bourbon barrel aged uh, beer I've ever had, uh, but definitely tasty. I definitely recommend it. Uh, four out of five drinking horns for the... A buffalo sweat bourbon barrel aged. So let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking for one about art. And I found a really insightful one by Edward Degas, French painter. It goes something like this. Painting is easy when you don't know how, but very difficult when you do. See you guys next week.